What if I were to tell you that there is a prayer plan written by God that is so simple even a child could understand it? It consists of seven easy guides that you can learn just by reading a handful of verses. This is a journey that for me is more than 25 years in the making that has taken me from a place where I fundamentally did not understand prayer and even had doubt to a place where my daily talks with God feel like a conversation. And the best part about it is you can make this journey too, but it doesn't have to take you 25 years. Hey everybody, I'm your Bible nerd, Jared, and this is Biblically Speaking, the program that's focused on understanding and living in God's Word. Now, as I said in the intro, this is a video more than 25 years in the making that goes back to some of my struggles as a young Christian to believe that God was actually hearing my prayers. And believe me when I say, I know firsthand there is nothing more fundamental to building a strong and healthy relationship with God than prayer. And that's at the heart of the very first of these guides, and that is prayer is not about the words that we choose or how well we speak. It's about the relationship that we're building with God. Basically, are we using prayer as an opportunity to draw near to God and know him better? And this reminds me of when Jesus quotes Isaiah over in Matthew 15. He says to the Pharisees, you're drawing near to me with your mouth. You're honoring me with your lips, but your heart is very far from me. The very first and most important lesson is that prayer is the heart speaking. And that's why in Matthew 6, 10, he taught them to pray to God like God is their father, reminding them just a few verses later in Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11, to keep asking for what they need because God is, in fact, a good father. The lesson here is to see God as a source of good in our lives and to draw near to him the way that we would draw near to someone who loves us. We're not trying to appease God with our prayers. We're not trying to... to change his mind about us. What we're doing is we're building a relationship that he's already said he wants to have with us. And this leads us right into the second guideline, which is in prayer, nothing is off the table. Now, this is interesting because when I think about Matthew 6 and 6, where Jesus talks about praying in secret, I picture almost having this sacred space, this 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 private place where I can go and talk to God. This is a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your creator. Jesus is using that as a warning not to treat prayer like it's a piece of performance art, that it's not for the people who happen to be hearing, not to go into just repeating the same phrases that we've always heard. But it also should serve as a reminder that nothing is off limits in prayer. Because we're speaking to God in secret, we can really be genuine with him. That means if we're creating boundaries around things that we can and can't talk Talk about in prayer, then what we're really saying is that's somewhere that God is not welcome in our life. And it doesn't matter if those boundaries are around our finances, our relationships, our struggles with things like health or depression, or, or even doubt about our relationship with him. Some people feel like, I can't say to God, I, I wish you felt nearer to me. That's funny because David says that all the time in the Psalms. If we're drawing those boundaries, then we're fundamentally telling God that he's not part of this solution, that we're not accepting his counsel or his will when it comes to this area of our life. And that leads us to the third guideline, that prayer in many ways is about learning who God is. In Matthew 6 and 10, Jesus taught them to pray that God's will be done. He prayed that same prayer over in Luke 22 and 42 when he was praying for the cup to pass from him in the garden and saying, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And this gets right to the heart of knowing God because prayer is a petition to change God's mind on some matter. We can in some ways influence the will of God, or at least maybe his design for our immediate future and those of the people around us. Think about King Hezekiah in the book of Isaiah, who twice petitioned God in very, very dire circumstances, and God actually heard his prayer. I'm not saying that God's going to send a mighty angel to avenge his will on the evil doers of this world, or that God's going to move the sun backwards so that we can know that he's extended our life. But just like he could change God's mind about some things, he's open to being influenced by our emotions and our desire to connect with him. 
And at times, like in the case of Daniel 6, where he's thrown into the lion's den, prayer can just be a source of strength to endure the will of God. Now, one word of caution here. We want to be careful about thinking about prayer in a prosperity gospel sort of way, like the word of faith movement, because I speak it in faith. God is definitely going to do this. You want to be very careful about that. Anybody that's telling you that is definitely not telling you the truth. Paul prayed three times for a thorn in the flesh to be removed, and his answer was from Jesus my grace is sufficient for thee. But God is open to having his mind changed. And this is kind of a bonus point here. I hope you're beginning to see that that one of the keys to really building this relationship with God that prayer is so fundamental to is also spending time with his word and gaining confidence in God. That brings us to the fifth guideline, which is prayer is an ongoing conversation with God. This is essentially what Jesus was teaching in two different parables found in the book of Luke. The first is in Luke 11, after his disciples ask him to teach them to pray, he begins to tell the parable of this persistent friend. He essentially tells the same parable over in Luke 18 with the persistent widow who's speaking to the unrighteous judge. Prayer is not just a list of requests, but rather it's a conversation. Imagine prayer as the foundation of a trusting and deeply intimate relationship with God, where each conversation draws you closer to him. That's essentially what Jesus was trying to explain in those two parables. Now, Paul adds another dimension to this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, when he tells them to rejoice in everything and pray without ceasing and in everything give thanks, because this is the will of God, that God wants to have these conversations. He wants us to be joyful with him. He wants us to reach out to him and petition him and tell him about our feelings feelings toward him, and he absolutely wants us to give thanks, and this is God's will. Which brings us to the sixth guideline. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. That idea of fervency and effectiveness is not talking about the passion with which we're approaching prayer, although it can be to some degree about that. But within the context, that word fervent or effective means that we're trying to show God that our request is worthy. In fact, in that passage, James is telling them to pray for some very big things. He says, look, you need to pray for the sick. You need to pray for those who are lost in sin. You need to pray for those who are your brethren who've been overtaken by sin. And then he uses this example of Elijah who prayed and it didn't rain for three years and six months. And then he prayed again and it rained. And all of this was about Elijah desiring the will of God to be done and raising this petition to God. Elijah was not afraid to pray for big things. And God wants us to know that we should be praying for big things. This is not about telling us how wonderfully effective Elijah's prayer was because he was a prayer warrior. This is about telling us how wonderfully effective our God is. And when we approach him in that manner, then we shouldn't be afraid to ask him for big things. Without even leaving the book of James, we come to the seventh and final point, And that is we have to learn to pray without doubting. And that's been the whole point of this prayer journey, right? We're told in James chapter one, beginning in verse five, that if we lack wisdom, we can ask of God and he'll give to us liberally. But the things that we ask for, we should ask without doubting. But the minute that we doubt that God hears or God cares, the efficacy of our prayer goes way down. God doesn't want us approaching him timidly. He doesn't want us approaching him with doubt. He wants us approaching him in confidence that if this is according to his will, if it really is good for us, then he is going to move in that way. Now, he wants us praying consistently because he may not move as quickly as we would like him to, or his answer may be no, but every prayer is an opportunity to grow that relationship. These seven guidelines have helped me deepen my relationship with God much more than I would have thought possible if I were just trying to navigate prayer on my own. I hope you got something out of it. If you did, you should have already smashed that subscribe and that like button. Thanks for joining me today, and may your journey in prayer lead you to a place that is filled with trust and intimacy with God. And until I see you again, have a good day, and God bless.